Greetings. Here's the Bell and Owl scope. Solid state oscilloscope triggered sweep 5 megahertz bandwidth. Woohoo. This was basically a schooling scope that students had to put together by themselves and then use it for experiments. In our last episode, we kind of tweaked knobs on this, fixed a minor thing, and got it to work. What you're looking at now is that it's basically displaying. I have the internal calibration generator hooked up, internally routed to the scope's input, and uh, it's just showing us a uh, sine wave. So it still works, still looks beautiful, still is totally useless. But the one thing we left open last time was there was a mystery prototype board mounted inside the scope that was obviously hand built. So there it is. I removed it from the inside of the scope, isolated it from the rest of the scope. And what we're going to do is have a look at it today and see what it does, if, if anything. And uh, what this is going to be is going to be a team effort. I have not sat down and drawn a schematic for it. I fixed or figured out a few minor connections on it so, so I can actually get a signal coming out of it. I can actually make it do something, I should say. I will share with you what I found, but I'm going to need your help to suggest what this was used for. Let's go over what's on this board, starting from the top over here. We have two caps, two resistors. Ooh. Uh, the first IC over here is a uh, 74LS123, which is a dual retriggerable monostable multivibrator with clear. The easiest way to put this is uh, it's basically a digital version of the uh, venerable 555 timer, and it has some more sophisticated gating logic on it, and there's two timers in there. So that is some sort of a TTL oscillator. You use analog components to set the, uh, the output frequency of the square wave on that. It's made by TI and it also has a house number on it which looks to me like a TI, TI a Heathkit house number because it starts with the number 300 dash 7952-00. Now if you can't see any uh, any way that that number, how that relates to a 74LS123, then you know a lot more than I do, but my uh, guess is that whenever they assigned house numbers to common parts or common ICs, that they just uh, rolled the dice and came up with a number. I don't think there's a correlation between the house number, I mean a logical correlation between the house number and the actual part number. They had a database somewhere that tells them what that is, but so we know what that chip is, it's fully described in the documentation. Next, the pretty light blue guy is a dip resistor pack that has a bunch of 1K resistors in it. I haven't tested it to see if they're bus or individual, but looking at the wiring in the back, I think they're individual resistors that go from adjacent, from opposite pins. Next we have uh, the, uh, the part that throws everything off, it's this chip here. It has a house number on it, again it looks like a Heathkit house number 300-757 but as we saw on this chip that number doesn't mean anything to us 
if we don't have the key, i.e. the database, that correlated that number to the industry standards. It's made by it and has a date code of 71, 43rd week in 1971, and its function is a mystery, at least for now. The fourth chip is a 7408, which is a standard TTL quad 2 input AND gate. Uh, no mystery, no house numbers on that. And the last I see is a 7405, which is a hex inverter with open collector outputs. And what that simply means is you can tie a whole bunch of outputs together, hardwire them, put a pull-up resistor on it, and you basically got yourself a multi-input OR gate. Next, we have four multi-turn potentiometers, which I don't know how many turns they are during my tests. I think I went ten turns either way. I didn't hit any stops on them, so they're probably probably 50 turn pots and they'll adjust whatever this board does or lets you trim that function. And then we got a bunch of wires running to the scope and a single wire over here running to a uh, single a uh, single contact jack on the back of the scope. What we have here are a bunch of switches and stuff that, that were added to the front panel. Uh, we have a uh, single pole, single throw switch. And uh, a triple pole, triple throw switch over here. And we'll talk about what what this affects. I still don't know exactly the function, but this one kind of decides whether the scope uses the original front input as a signal input or uses what this thing, what this board generates as an input. We have a momentary normally open switch here and we have a single input jack that goes over here. And that's about the best description I can give you. And oh, another thing is that there was a red wire there that went to this jack over here. And after looking at the, I mean, at the pinouts of the TTL chips, it is meant as a 5 volt power supply. There are no 5 volts on this on the scope. The, the closest you have are 9 volts DC. They could have put a 5 volt regulator on there and fed it from the 9 volts, but uh, for whatever purpose this was made, it was deemed more practical to power it externally with a 5 volt source. Those 5 volts don't go to the rest of the scope. They are localized to this board. And then look at this large capacitor here. A thousand microfarad 50 volt capacitor that is basically used to smooth the... Uh, or... Well, it's wired up as a bypass capacitor for the 5 volt rail on this board. This is kind of ridiculous because this assumes that there's regulated voltage coming in already. And you shouldn't have to put a capacitor this large on the regulated side of a power supply. Would have been better served with something like a 100 microfarad 10 volt cap that would do a better job than, uh, than this one's going to do on an already regulated line. But, hey, maybe this was the only thing available in whoever, on the builder's toolbox, and that's what he put in. But, yeah, it's kind of large. It's physically large, it's electrically large, and it's kind of 
unnecessary. So going back to the scope, it's still running on the internal, off the internal oscillation, the internal calibration oscillator. So what I figured out is the following. This switch selects whether the input comes from here or from here. So let's take it off the calibration setting and uh, and when we switch it to 2 we should see the internal signal. Except that there is no internal signal right now because I have not turned on the 5 volt supply which powers this board. So let's give it some juice. The trace nicely disappears. It's using up about what 93 milliamps. And now we've got to do some tweaking here. And I promise we'll get something. Sooner or later. There's something. And there it is. So, come on, who can tell what this is? It's a square wave, kind of, with a bottom leg. I mean, there's obviously an impedance match here, because the top portion of the uh, pulse looks kind of straight, but the bottom one is bent really badly. And I have, a, I have a hard time getting this to sync. I just had it though, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, you can kind of get it to sync, but... So that's it. So, uh, I've also found an output on here that shows the signal. And we can look at it on a uh, regular scope. I found a point on one of the switches that seems to output the square wave that this generates. Hooked it up to a scope. And that's what we have. A really nice looking square wave. And uh, what the scope says, it's basically set to 2 volts per vertical division, so we're looking at a maximum of, what is it, 4.56 volts, that's the peak voltage, a frequency of 25.7218 hertz, and a, oh, we need to have a look at the duty cycle. So, let's go to measure, channel 1, let's see, this thing does everything but the kitchen sink. So there should positive duty. The positive duty, well the, the, the duty cycle, the positive duty cycle is 22.3 percent. Now yeah that's that's very nice. Uh, I, I, I don't really know what the significance of those numbers is, but I went ahead and turned these pots, these multi-turn pots, 10 turns in either direction. And my full expectation was that these would affect the amplitude, frequency, duty cycle, what else is there? There really isn't anything else. And something else. So you could adjust this uh, square wave. And, uh, and you know, that's about as far as I came. There is another jack added, even though it says input over here. This input refers to this and, and the red jack under it. This is connected to the center switch, but I can't 
see anything coming out of it and I can't see anything and when I put a signal into it from the signal generator I can't see it appear. So that's all I know about this mod. So I need to ask you if if you know what this is please let yourself be known because I'm curious. I think this was purpose built for some experiment, maybe looking at the course materials uh, for the scope would would give a hint because you would think that if somebody built the scope and then it was kind of a pain in the ass to get the uh, the proper square wave for one of the experiments or several one of them they decided to build this thing to make the experiments easier or maybe it was a prototype and they wanted to go into production with it I don't know but, if you know, let me know. Probably rare to find someone watching this who might actually know what this is. But, what you can do is give it a good guess of what you think this did. And give a brief explanation of why you've come up with that guess. And that would make things, that would make things a lot uh, more clear to me. Now, of course, uh, you know that the next step in here, if we were, if I were so inclined, would be to sit down and reverse engineer this thing and draw a schematic for it. And uh, that would make things a lot more clear, except for the unidentified chip that is labeled 300-757, made by IT&T, with a date code of 7143 on it. Once we had that, we could reverse engineer it, draw the schematics, figure out exactly where all of these connections go, and, uh, I mean, inside the scope, and then we would know exactly what it is, and maybe something's defective on it. Maybe the reason these pots aren't working is because one of the chips is defective, and it's just pumping out a square wave that can't be adjusted. And another thing is keep in mind this is this is a digital circuit here, except the unknown chip in the middle that may be analog, but there really isn't a whole lot <clears throat> you can do with these uh with these multi turn pots on a digital circuit. I mean you could change the clock frequency and stuff like that. On the uh, 74123 it uses analog external cir uh, external components to set the frequency and duty cycle and all of that good stuff. So maybe that's what it is, but uh, again, the next step would be to reverse engineer it. And uh, I'm just going to leave it a mystery from my point of view and let my viewers do some of the work this time because this scope is a nice historical piece, but other than that, it's not really very useful. So I think I've invested enough time in it. Time for you guys to invest some time and come up with some good thought experiments about this. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Oh, some quick bonus footage in case I didn't make this abundantly clear. First point is I turned the pots all over the place and they did not affect the uh, square wave that it was generating in any way, shape or form. Second of all, we didn't discuss this button. And what this button does is the switch here labeled AM is basically auto trigger and manual trigger. So what you can do is if you put this into manual trigger mode, every time you hit the switch, which is normally open, momentary, closed, you get a single pulse out of it. So it basically sends a single pulse of the square wave well, a single cycle of the square wave out, and that's essentially a pulse it's generating, which, you know, would, would, which on a non-storage oscilloscope is totally useless. So somewhere around here, that pulse must be coming out. Unfortunately, it isn't this jack, which I hoping would be it, and uh, to inject pulses into your experimental circuits.